about photography, um, I am an admirer of um, uh, fashion photographer Peter Lindbergh. He's a German photographer. He passed away just two days ago. It was um, it was heartbreaking when I heard the news. Two photographers, um, that would be Miles uh, Aldrich, is a British uh, fashion photographer, and he <clears throat> and Vincent Peters, another German photographer. And both of them, um, I would say, they shoot uh, mostly on films, cameras, and you can ha hardly tell. It was so perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Design Exchange. I am your host, Thomas Grove, and together with me today is Reggie Doan. Am I saying your last name well enough? I can take that. How would you, how would you say it? It's uh, Reggie Yuan, but it's, um, it's rather hard for foreigners to actually pronounce my name. So I'm, I'm actually good with Doan. This is, you know, my time in America is always... Reggie Doan, so it's all right. It's all right. So I know Reggie as a photographer. Um, actually, I have a video on this on my YouTube channel, a night a about Saigon or a, now a night around Saigon. And we walked around all night long taking photos, kind of like a photo walking tour all night long. Later, uh, Reggie was the photographer of the very first photo shoot for the Athena jacket, which is a project I spent a lot of time working on. And then, not long after that, he moved to America for several years. Two and a half years, actually. So, uh, first, like, how did, how did moving to America become a thing that was even possible? Like, where did that come from? Um, so, actually, it started um, about 12 years ago. And uh, my, f my uncle family, who who actually um, been living in Oklahoma City, the U.S. for ages. And he actually wanted to bring my family over. And um, so we started doing the paperwork for 12 years. And when I thought it would never happen, it actually happened. And um, so after... I graduated from college um, years ago. I thought I would go to Germany instead, but the paperwork came. Were you studying and, German? Uh, I was studying German, um, like economics in German language. Um, I lost it because I, I haven't actually used German for a long time. So yeah, it's, it, I, I, still, I still understand if I read it, I it still understand, but in order for me to actually um, engage in the full conversation in German is impossible now for me, yeah. How, does, how do you go from studying German ep economics in German language in Vietnam mm -hmm. to, is your, is, to uh, following a passion of photography? Oh, uh, it's actually, it's, it didn't have anything to do with photography because um, when I, you know, after I graduated from high school, my family wanted to um, me to leave the country and, you know, um, go to a foreign countries, perhaps Germany, perhaps the U.S. And because we, th we thought that the paperwork uh, to the U.S. would never happen. We thought that it would never work. So my aunt, who lives in Germany, said to my family, like, you know, Reggie, just go study German. When you graduate it, we, um, I will bring you over to Germany. So I did. And it is it's a beautiful language, in my opinion. Not a lot of people thing the same way because a lot of people I know think German is a very harsh shouting language but you know having studied it for about five years 
I think is a beautiful la language. And I would, I would love to visit Germany someday. Um, but as soon as I graduated, um, the paperwork to America finally worked. Um, so my family decided to go to Germany, uh, sorry, to U the U.S. instead. So you went to the U.S. with your family? Yes. Uh, now, are you back in Vietnam temporarily, or, or like, is this vacation for you, or are you moving back here? Um, I don't know yet. Um, indefinitely, I say. Um, at least for the next two years, I'll be here. And um, it's for work, because... Um, I see more opportunities here for me to do photography because I've got connections here. I've got my base here, my family here. Most of my closest friends are still here. So I think um, I see more opportunities here than, you know, where I live, which is uh, which was Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, it's a beautiful city, but um, it's for me, it's not enough. I'm a big city boy. I I miss the sound, I miss the noise, I miss the craziness, I miss the traffic, and I'm, I miss the crazy weather in Saigon, man. These are all the things I'm trying to escape from. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, you, you've been living in Saigon for how long? Uh, about eight years. Eight years? Wow. Yeah. It's a long time, man. <laughs> Longer than most, but not, not as long as some. Yeah. But yeah, you know, Portland is beautiful. It's I love the sceneries, I love the beer, I love the food. It's a fantastic city. It's um, it's really f quite friendly, really liberal, and um, but for me, it's somehow depressing a bit. Is it overcast a lot there? Yes, yeah. it rains um, throughout the years. Um, it rains a lot. Yes, it's overcast, and every time I, I decided to actually go hiking or go to the beach, it started to rain. So I, I didn't really see much of Oregon, and be, because um, I have a full time work, so I didn't get a chance to travel that much. But I would, I would love to go back and travel. Did you get a chance to do? Uh, actually, while you were there, were you studying or were you just working? Kind of. Yeah, I just I was working in Italy. I didn't study because, um, um, to be honest, studying in America is quite expensive. And um, besides, I've got um, a university degrees here, so I might use it. And um, yeah, most most of the time, I just working nine to five. And um, yeah, I didn't have a chance to go around much. Were you working in photography, or you had some job just to pay the the bills? Um, I worked at an eye clinic actually, as a manager of an eye clinic, and um, this is my you know nine to five job. And I do occasionally photography, like I shoot. Um, I would shoot on a weekend, and. That's it, with my friends and, you know, pay clients. And that, yeah, I still, I did photography, but not as much I I could do here. Right. Um, do you see photography as a profession that you can make a full-time living in? Um, for me, like, one of the reasons why, why I go back to Vietnam is because I wanted to study uh, in marketing and business administration because I wanted to become creative director too. And photography is a passion for me. It's been my hobby for over 10 years. But for me to have like a full-time photography job, sometimes it could get boring. Um, I want to do both photography and, you know, creative directions. So that's what I'm been I've been doing at the moment so creative direction would be at an ad agency or what kind of company would you be a creative director at um 
mostly for fashion and I would say I'm trying to get into the you know the filming the video roughly um, kind of industry because um, I've got friends uh, who who are artists who are musicians and they like to film a lot of you know music videos and they've been looking desperately for a really good creative director and because um, some of my friends are um, in metal bands and because I came from a very very heavy metal background so I kind of understand the cultures I I know about heavy metal I think I could do a really good job in you know create being a uh, being a creative creative director for a heavy metal MV have you worked on any music video projects yet not yet but very soon um i am collaborating with a few artists here in saigon and we have um met each other and we talked about it and the process is still going so i'm really looking forward to it what was the experience of living uh, and <clears throat> qualify this by saying most of the people I've talked to on this podcast are Americans living in Vietnam or Americans living in Japan. Uh -huh. um, so I think you're the first Vietnamese or Japanese living in America. Oh, okay. who I, you know, kind of the reverse situation. So, uh, what ha what's been your ex what was your experience of American culture, American life? How would you contrast it to life in Vietnam? Um, how can I say it? Um, I I didn't get a chance to travel around America much. I lived in Oklahoma for, with my family for a few months. I didn't like it because um, it's a very, you know, it's um, it's it's a big city, but it's very spread out and. It's boring is when you you come downtown Friday or Saturday night, there's nobody on the street. It's, um, it was very depressing, more than Portland. And then I moved to Portland alone, and I lived there alone. I made some friends there. Um, about American cultures is, how can I say it? Um, I like it. I... It's a right country, to be honest, but um, because I lived in Portland and I met a lot of people who are very creative, who are very open-minded, but after a while, they all moved away from Portland for some reason. Um, I can't say much about um, American culture because I didn't get to hang out a lot with a lot of people because I couldn't really connect with a lot of people in Portland for some reason. Uh, I didn't have many friends there. Um, it was, I don't know about other cities. I can't say anything about, uh, about it, but um, I think I need to actually travel more around America to actually answer that question properly, you know. One of the things that I think is most characteristic of most of America is how the society is built around the automobile. Mm -hmm. You pretty much have to drive everywhere with the exception of New York city. You don't need to have a car. Oh yeah. Um, San Francisco, you don't have to have a car. You, how about Portland? You, I oh. see, I watch, uh, it seems a lot of people in Portland use bicycles. Oh yes. Is bicycle is very, you know, it's so popular in Portland. People ride bicycles a lot. Um, um, the city is very green, and they, you know, the authorities try to do ev try everything to, you know, protect the, the, you know, the environment, which is a good, very good thing. Portlanders um, 
are really good at recycling, really good at keeping the city clean. And like you said, a lot of um, you know cyclists around the city um, scares me sometimes because uh, sometimes they just came out of nowhere, and some of them are quite reckless. But you know, in general, they are you know just keeping the city clean. And um, well, yeah, when I was right. I don't know when I was living in. I know that when I was living in San Francisco, one of the oftentimes cited criticisms of bicyclists was them not stopping at red lights. Uh, that was the main one. It's like, hey, how come the cars have to stop at the stop sign or the red light and the bicycles don't tend to? Um, I rode a bicycle for a large portion of my time there, and... Uh, it's not necessarily an easy city to bike in because of the hills. So you want to save your energy when as, as much as possible. You know, for a car to m start moving at a red light, it's just the driver has to push their foot down on the gas and then it starts going. Mm -hmm. But if you're going from a standstill on a bicycle, you have to exert a lot of kind of energy to oh, yeah. gather your initial momentum. So I am kind of sympathetic to both. Arguments, you know, I think sometimes the reckless driving of of a bicycle is just the bicyclist trying to m maintain the momentum, so they, you know, they don't have to exert the energy to I, I, go I, up from a complete stop. I know you what you mean. Um, in Poland, well, it's not as hilly as Seattle's or San Francisco. However, you know, there are parts of Portland are very hilly, but you know, when I Every time I ride downtown, I have to be very careful because of the cyclists, first, uh, firstly. Were you driving a car or how yes, were you I, around? Yeah, I was driving a car. Um, I didn't really want it. Um, I didn't want to buy a car, but I, um, I lived in a small apartment and it was in the middle of a hill. So it was rather hard for me to get around without a car because um, I have to walk downhill um, to the bus station, which is um, 15 minutes away. Um, and, you know, like I said, in Portland, it rains a lot. And, you know, when, you know, winter time, it's, it snows, it gets icy on the road, lots of people trip and fell. Um, so I... I needed to buy a car, you know. Otherwise, I could have um, gone around the city using, um, you know, the bus. The bus, uh, you know, the bus system in Portland is pretty great, and uh, they have um, what do you call it? Um, they call it as a max in Portland. It's a max. It's like um, electric electric train to go, for, you know, around the city. And they go throughout the city um, from where I live to um, downtown Portland. But uh, in order for me to get to the max, um, it would take half an hour. No, actually, 45 minutes walk. So it's, um, it was difficult. Once you get there, you're okay. But Yeah, <laughs> but then, you know, get through the rain, it rains a lot. Yeah, it rains like crazy in Portland. Portland has been in the news a lot recently, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, because I didn't notice. Uh, there's a lot of protests and counter protests. Oh, I that being I organized a lot. Yes, um, Be between the Nazis and the Antifa, and between the Nazis and the anti-Nazis. Yeah, <laughs> or, or you know, between the white nationalists and the anti-fascist fascist club. Yes. Yeah, that happens a lot, yes. During my time there, so I try to avoid that because it was a mess. And it I, seems like if you can avoid being in the area that that stuff's going down. Yeah, yeah. it happens mostly downtown, I think. I, I love downtown Portland. It's a beautiful city. But, um, you know, I'm lazy to go there because I. it's so hard to find parking lots. Um, it's quite expensive. Um but I, every time I go there, I just park very far away 
and I just walked around the downtown of Portland for three or four hours. I love walking around the city, so yeah, it's clean. It's it's super clean out there. Do you think some of your enjoyment of it sounds like you were living quite a bit away from the city center? Yes, I did. Do you think if you had been living in the city center, it would have changed your experience? I don't think. Um, I. I don't really think so, because um, one of the thing is the demand for fashion photography in Portland is not big, um, and um, as a fashion, like I'm a portrait photographer, and I'm doing more and more in fashion photography. I'm trying to get into the fashion industry, and but Portland is not. You know, um, it's still developing, to be honest. And if one wants to do fashion photography, one has to go to New York, CC, London, or maybe Los Angeles. But it was, um, it would be very competitive, and besides, it would be very expensive. And because I, you know, I know a lot of. Um, people here. Um, I've got connections here. I can do a lot of, you know, I can actually plan and concepts for a fashion ph photo shoots with um, less money than what I would sp have to spend in America. Um, studio rental, uh, equipment rental. I know models here. I know makeup artists um, with whom I could, you know, collaborate. Yeah, and uh, in Poland, I I I don't know anyone. And besides, um, you know, style-wise, um, um, Portlanders got different taste in fashion and in, you know, photography sense. Are very different to what I'm doing, so um, it's not for me. Really. So, how would you describe your style sense? What's uh, the general artistic vision you're trying to create? Oh well, um, about photography, um, I am an admirer of um, the late uh, photographer, uh, fashion photographer Peter Lindbergh. Is a German photographer. He passed away just two days ago. It was, um, it was heartbreaking when I heard the news because um, for over nine years he's been the greatest inspiration for myself and for you know countless of photographers around the world. He was the pioneer in you know black and white fashion photography, and he was um, how can I say it? Um, he put the word super in the supermodel and he guided the, the very first generation of supermodels such as uh, Cindy Crawford, um, Naomi Campbell or Kate Moss. Um, and he, you know, he was 74 years of age and he, you know, throughout his life, he shot countless of celebrities and you know, for fashion brands, for, you know, actresses, actors around the world. And um, I would see myself, um, I would love to do what he he did. Um, especially in, he was very good at photographing women. And um, the way he photograph women was rather different uh, to different you know the other photographers he would go with you know very light or even without makeups he captured the most i would say the raw moments the the true beauty of a woman um i would say uh how can i describe him there's so much to say about him but um yeah I would say I love photographing women. That's my greatest passion, to be honest. And I love black and white. 
um, I'm trying to follow his path and live up to his legacy. And that style of photography is not very popular amongst the Portland fashion scene. No, it wasn't. And uh, it is not in even in Vietnam, but um, that's what I'm trying to do. Like I would try to follow him and his path. But at the same time, I, I'm trying to create, like, I'm trying to create my own signature look, um, like a distinct look for my, you know, whenever I shoot for my personal portfolio. Of course, if I if I were to shoot for big clients or you know any kind of clients, I would have to uh, follow what the brief says, um, what the clients. Uh, was wanting to do, but if I were to shoot for my my own portfolio, I would I would try to create my own signature look, and that's what I'm been trying to do, and I think I've been doing pretty well. How close are you to saying this is my signature look, defining um, your look? Um. I would say halfway, because um, my my portraits, um, especially of women, have been described as very strong. Uh, the contrast is strong, uh, a bit rainy sometimes. It looks like it was shot on films. I do film photography sometimes. This is um, I shot a lot of black and white films too. Um, so comparing to other photographers that I know around Saigon, um, my phot- my photography work, um, the portraits contains more contrasts, and the people oftentimes they looked um, they could look sad, they could look depressing, they could look confused not always smiling um and i would tell i would every time i do a shoot um for like a portrait shoot i would just tell the model to act normally and i just try to capture the best moment of um you know i just stand there and silently take photos if needed i could guide a model i could tell uh, them what to do, but oftentimes I just would tell, I would tell them to you know act normally and and I would just constantly clicking. Um, I would say um, it creates a cinematic feel, you know, in the photos, the movements and the emotions. So that's what I, I've been doing. To get an image that you're happy with, how much of the work is done on set versus how much do you push it, push the image in Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever your I- image editing? Do you do any image do 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 you do any processing of your photography to get it to your final result? Oh yes, I do. Um, I have to turn most of my you know I I take. Of course, um, fo- color photos on on my digital camera, but um, I would turn them into black and white uh, using either Lightroom or Photoshop. And for fo- Photoshop, I would normally use Photoshop for, you know, taking out uh, blemishes or if I had to go to details. Um, zoom in to go to detail, taking out blemishes or um, spots. I use Photoshop, but uh, if I were to edit the duty color editing, I would use Lightroom. It works. Um, it helps me. It helps me work way faster in Photoshop. Yeah. Uh I worked with a guy who did, he used Photoshop, what's it called, the raw, I don't know what they call it actually, but Photoshop has 
kind of Lightroom built into it in terms of processing raw files. Mm -hmm. And he, he never used Lightroom. He'd only use Photoshop. Photoshop. But um, I think every single thing he's working on is kind of like a, a hero image or something. It's the, let's say you did a photo, a photo shoot with mm -hmm. 100 pictures and he's going to deliver five to the client. So he's okay. just focusing on those five. Whereas if I'm uh, going on a family vacation or something and I'm just taking snapshots mm -hmm. and I kind of want to apply a bit of correction to all of my images or, you know, they're all raw files. So if I even want to share them, I have to do something to convert them to JPEG oh, okay. in the first place. I found something like Lightroom where mm -hmm. you can... Uh, do like a mass production. You can see all yes. the pictures at once, and then you can exactly. go into a few. You can um, kind of easily mark the ones that you think are your top tier pictures, and then start focusing on those. Maybe make some color corrections and then apply it to several images at once. I see. You know that that was a better workflow. And then only when you had to do some kind of special effects to it would you say edit. You know, continue editing this in Photoshop for exactly you know, if you wanted to do some kind of compositing with it. Um, I use, but I would, I would use uh, Photoshop for most. Um, one main reason is for skin retouching. Like I said, um, like smoothing the skin. If I were to do like a high fashion or a really beauty photography kind of shoot, because um, with you know when you shoot high fashion or beauty photography, you have to have like a perfect skin. You have to take care of all the, you know, wrinkles, all the spots, all the... Some some people, just, you know, they don't even like uh, freckles on their faces. So sometimes, you know, you have to, re uh, you know, you have some requests from the customers. Oh, can you take them out? I don't want them. I don't want to see them on my face. Or, you know, a lot of uh, liquid, you know, liquefy too. Yeah, so liquify, for those that don't know, is the main technique that's used in photo retouching to make someone's butt a little bigger, make, oh, make their their uh, waist a little smaller, make their legs a little longer. It's kind of uh, the most effective way in, in Photoshop to uh, stretch or shrink or expand things without it looking too weird. Yes. Um, some people actually over overdo it a lot. Um, but um, my favorite photographer, Peter Lindbergh, um, like I mentioned before, he was always against the use of Photoshop in his image. He would never touch Photoshop. Most of, the, most of his work, um, if they had to be Photoshopped, it was somebody else um, got a Photoshop guys to do it for him, and if you looked at his, if you look at his um, personal work, he kept all the raw emotions in his photos, the blemishes, um, the wrinkles, because he he saw the beauty in, you know, in its truest form, not, you know, retouch. And of course, when he did, you know, photo shoot like high fashion photo shoot for uh, Louis Vuitton or for Gucci, Dior, um, those photos had to be Photoshop. They had to look perfect. But for his personal work, you would never see any, you know, smooth skins or you know, perfect bodies. There is no such thing as. A perfect body in his view. Um, he's got uh, one of my favorite uh, photo books of Peter. It's called um, The Portraits of Women, one and two. There's two volumes, and it is a worth. It's very. It's raw emotion. Um, the I was overwhelmed by how beautiful those women, you know, photographed by Peter. Um, 
Um, you know, the, the fashion world as well as the <coughs> photography world are mourning him at the moment. And it was sad to see, like, on my Instagram feed, all the celebrities from, you know, from the 90s up to now, um, posting tributes to Peter at the moment. And um, it was heartbreaking. He was, um, and will always be my greatest uh, inspiration. Who uh, Are there any other photographers that you admire or... Um, Look towards for inspiration. Oh yes, um, I would say the sec. I've got two two photographers um, who come in second. Uh, that would be Miles uh, Aldrich, is a British uh, fashion photographer, and he <clears throat> and Vincent Peters, another German photographer, and both of them. Um, I would say. They shoot uh, mostly on films, cameras, and you can ha hardly tell. It was so perfect. There's, their work is just, they are amazing. And they are, you know, fashion and portrait photographers too. I would say for portrait photographer, I've got another one who is Platon. And he photographed the many artists, many, you know, politicians from Barack Obama, Donald Trump, even he, he flew to Russia to actually photograph and interview um, the whistleblower uh, Edward Snowden in his hotel in Russia. And it was amazing video to watch. You can find it on YouTube. Um, he photographed Adele, Roger Ferrer, Will Smith, Dr. Dre, every, you know, the, the A-list celebrities too. And he was, I would say he is my third favorite. His, um, his photographic style is very strong contrast on the white background mostly. And uh, it's Platon, it's uh, P-L-A-T-O-N. It's quite simple. That's how I'd spell it. Yeah. I think it's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah. I love names that when you hear them, you can spell them. Yeah. You know? Even if they're There's a very a weird name. Uh, some some people pronounce his name like Platon or, you know, differently. But he, I think he pronounces his name as Platon. It's quite simple. That's why you, that's why you're, why your last name is going to become Doan. Yeah, it's like, zone, it's like Ni Nikon and Nikon. Right. It's, it's, you know, sometimes you, you don't know how to pronounce a word. So it's, it's, it's okay, to, you know, for people to, you know, to mispronounce my, na my last name. I, I don't really care. All of that made me think of uh, Sony's name. Sony? Yeah. The electronics company. Yep. And then I thought, oh, actually, that's not really relevant to this conversation. But, you know. <laughs> what did it make you think of Sony? Oh. Uh, Is there any way? To... I guess just that it's, that if you see it, you can say it. Yeah. You know. Exactly. Somehow. It's, it's so, it's quite simple. Yeah. Do you know the um, president of, the founder of Sony? Mm -hmm. Their name used to be some very long, convoluted name, like, Japan, Japan, tele, you know, Japan, um, s uh, transistor parts manufacturer company or something lame oh. like that. And, uh, he said, from now on, our name's going to be Sony. And everybody's like, why? And he's like, because Sony has the sound of a worldwide, brand. um, you know, famous electronics brand. Oh, yes. We're making semi, we're, we're making a uh, transistor based things right now, but in the future, we're going to be doing we're going to be the biggest guys. <laughs> so we yeah, well, that reflects it, that. It makes sense that everyone, everyone can spell it and it, uh, everyone can pronounce it. Just like Apple, it's rather simple to, you know, pronounce, to remember. I call it Apple. Oh, interesting. <laughs> no, I'm just Apple. kidding. I'm, I know. Uh, uh, speaking of things that are said weirdly in Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. 
How about that video conferencing software <laughs> that begins with an S and S K Y P E? Oh, Skype? Or <laughs> yeah, Skype? Oh, Skype. I don't yeah, know. I don't, for for whatever reason. Uh, yeah. Americans think it's Skype, and Vietnamese think it's Skypey. I don't know. I I just actually my one of my my Irish friend actually pronounces as Skypey. I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I don't it's, know. If it's they, strange. I don't know if they have like an official audio sample on their website that says this is how it should be pronounced, but it's yeah. definitely open to interpretation. It's like Nike. There you go. Nike is another another. Example for you know, when I was a kid, everyone know, knew it as uh, Nike, and like you know, Mike, like Mike, <laughs> yeah. And then at the age of you know, when I reached um, secondary school, my my aunt who you know has been living in America said, oh, "It's Nike." I said, "Why is Nike?" Well, it's, it's like if you look at the name Mike, it's Mike. Right. It's not Mikey. And why is it not Nike? Ah, Nike, yes. Yeah, Nike, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's weird. I kind of wish that there was more formalization in the way that English was spelled. Yeah. yeah it's kind of the current spelling of things is a combination of evolution of the language over time and different... Uh, I watched something yesterday i think even two days ago about how the printing press okay changed the spelling because oh you know they didn't want to use more letters than they had to oh yeah and they didn't want to have special like accents or anything because it's too much trouble yeah lose the accent you know yes. so they uh became kind of at that point in technology became more simplified um it's kind of interesting that with with vietnamese it has all these accents, and yes. I can type it without accents. If I was typing to you in Messenger or something, it could be quite. Um, I mean, without the accents, I was I would say sometimes it's it baffling. It's is really confusing. Sometimes you don't even know which for, which word I'm trying to say. Yes, even when I speak to my mom or my friends, who you know, I always type with accents. I always do. But you know my 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 mom and my my friends who are a bit lazier, they just type without the accent. It's just sometimes it came out wrong, and it's but you know there's conf confusion. What did people do on um, feature phones? Feature phones. Yeah, like the before smartphones, when you would send a text message by f like an old Nokia, uh, how would you? Are you you mean the uh, oh? If you're just sending an SMS yes, or something, that was confusing. Then you have to ask. You have to. Uh, what did you mean by saying that word? Is that this word? Because there was. Was word? it possible to input accented characters back then? Um, when the QWERTY keyboard came out, it was easier. But before before the QWERTY keyboard, uh, it was um, a little bit confusing sometimes. So you have to guess. Uh, you have to guess based on, you know, the context. But sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't even make sense. So I think that's why I always type with accent. So it makes things less complicated, less confusing. Of English, Vietnamese, and German, which one do you think is uh, the easiest language to learn? Um, I would say English, because Vietnamese. Um, I mean the. I, mm. It's not really fair to ask you how how is it, how easy is it to learn Vietnamese because I assume you just learned it as your well, mother tongue. Grammar wise, um, Vietnamese, I I would say we have quite flexible grammar, and it's not that difficult. It's not really difficult. What's difficult about Vietnamese language is um, it's a very musical, just like Thai language. It's very musical, tonal sort of um language and um there we go we got a lighting change <laughs> yeah. oh, um, i changed my white balance oh well it is what it is 
Yeah. So yeah, Vietnamese is tonal and I suppose even sing songy in a way, as as you were saying. Yeah, if you if you use a different accents on the same word, I say, it means different things. So there are many hilarious um you know, mis interpretation uh, interpretation. Um or maybe yeah, I mean I, I I've been in so many fun conversations with my foreign friends who were who were trying to learn Vietnamese and they used um the the wrong accent on you know the word they, they were supposed to use. And I, I, I know is I have the I, best example of that. I don't even know if I've given it before on this podcast. I I may have. Um but I I used to try to ask where do you live? Mm-hmm. And instead, I was saying, "Where do you feel good?" I'm trying to think how it happened. So I'd be like, "Em sum odao," and I'm supposed to say, "Em sum odao." Oh yes, something like that. Oh, em sum odao. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and to me, I, I don't know, sum and sum are so close. Yeah. You know? Even even now, I'm not sure which one is which one. <laughs> Just eight have to years, guess. Mate, eight, <laughs> eight years, and you didn't learn anything. I I kind of gave up pretty early on. I understand. You know, I uh, I was working at GameLoft, and thankfully they sponsored a language uh -huh. class, like uh, three days a week during lunchtime. We would study uh, Vietnamese, which was fantastic. Um, but I find that after you get past a certain amount of basic vocabulary, like please, thank you. Uh, I'll have one beer. Oh yeah, I'll have that's two basic conversation. Cokes, whatever, just very everyday stuff. Um, once you get past that, language classes have to start teaching you um, less commonly used things, and in some way, it's harder to be motivated when you're like, I'm not sure when I'm going to use this. Like, how many times I'm going to get a chance to practice? I see this sentence structure or this vocabulary. And the other hard part about studying Vietnamese is you can come right out of a class, go to lunch, and try to use what you learned that day. And the people who you're interacting with very likely have no idea what you're saying. Because I, I can understand you know, that. It was good enough for the class. Yes. But it's not accurate that the pronunci your pronunciation, my pronunciation, isn't accurate enough for somebody who uh is expecting to hear English coming exactly. out. Exactly, that's what I yeah. I was trying to say because um, <laughs> when is, when they see a foreigner's face, they would expect okay, maybe English would come right out of their mouth, and all of a sudden they ask for like like an ashtray, like my friend did. I I taught him the other day how to ask for an ashtray, and he we went to like a beer, like a pub, and he said, Richie, shut up. Let me do it. And he said, he asked for an ashtray and the... Ashtray. Yeah. Yeah. And the the waitress was confused. Can she, you te teach me quickly how to say, how do you have an ashtray or can I have an ashtray? Ashtray? Yeah. Oh, well, it's... Uh, ashtray mean, uh, is gạc tàn thuốc. Gạc tàn thuốc? Yes. T-U-C-T-U? Uh, is G A T, uh, and then T A N, and T H U O C. Took. You know, you can say the the thing is like I taught him to say, you know, they can basically understand if you say gatan only, but if you are Vietnamese, but if you are foreigners, it's best to say. You know that the word "took" at the end. Yeah, it's so say like, easier for them to. Cho toi gak tang tuk. Yes, exactly. Yes. So basically, is uh, Vietnamese is, I would say is, um, I think I I saw on a chart uh, of difficulties between languages, Vietnamese is rated as um, quite difficult to learn. Yeah. But still, it's not as hard as um, things like German, Polish, or Cantonese, uh, Mandarins, 
those are way over. Harder. Yeah, a lot harder than. So I would say English would be the easiest one, in my opinion. The problem with English is it has so many exceptions to every rule, and so many different wor- ways to say the same thing. Yeah, I I I was struggling with, um, you know, the way um, American spell th- uh, spell things because um, you know British people spell different way, you know, pronounce words different way too. So. Um, when I first came to America, I because I learned my English with um, a lot of British and Irish, so they they were actually having hard time understanding me, and I was definitely having hard time understanding them. But um, sometimes I could get the what they call it, the you know accent uh, changing accent syndrome. When you started to sound like the people um, in in which you are living in, you know uh, the environment. Like sometimes I I started to sound really American. Sometimes. All right, let's do a uh, experiment. Let's say something simple. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, hi, how are you today? It's pretty simple, right? Yeah. Let's say that with an American accent. I can't do American accent. Try. Do your best. <laughs> what what was it again? Which well, is any any simple thing you might say like hello how are you today? Hello how are you today? And now with an Irish accent. Irish? Um hey what's this crack? Okay. I don't even know what you just said. No, it's uh it's how Irish people actually um saying to each other. That's what I I picked up. All right. Yeah, uh, what's the crack? What's it's a uh, crack means uh, fun. Crack means uh, you know I'm having I'm having good crack, and that means I'm having fun. Um, it's C um, C R A I C. Oh wow! Yeah. Or Irish people sometimes uh, say, uh, "What's the story?" And American would respond with, "Why? Why does that? Why, <laughs> like, why, well, I was what, born. What kind of story? I was born. Yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes in in American English we'll say what's your story. Um oh what's your story? Yeah. I didn't I never heard anyone. So if I say that to you it would kind of go over the topics that we talked today. Well, okay, I'm a photographer from Vietnam. I lived in oh, I America see. for a while. Now I'm back to Vietnam. That's your story. Simplified. Oh, I, see. I see. Yeah, I I don't know what what my accent sounds like, but it is uh, definitely not American. I can't do American accents, so it's hard to place. Yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of German sounding yeah, inflections I, I and some Vietnamese sounding inflections, and yes, some English, uh, like British sounding. I would I wouldn't say German because I haven't used German for a very long time. I haven't spoken German for, I would say, five years. Right. Yeah. But when Germans speak English, they speak it in a in a certain way, and there's yeah. a little bit of that. But it's very clear, I would say, when German yeah when German people speak English, I they make every word sound very clear, and it's so easier to understand actually. Yeah. So for any Germans out there, thank you for your clear pronunciation. Yep. Reggie appreciates it. I love German. I love German uh, language. So how do you find Vietnam? I mean, comparing to Japan, the the lives, I mean... That's pretty easy to... Um, they're pretty easy to contrast, I'd say. Um for instance, in the morning, mm-hmm. in Japan, during the morning commute, the loudest sound you hear is footsteps. Oh. Which sounds poetic when I say it, but um, it's pretty much true. There's no honking, very little engine noises. It's just footsteps. Um, so that's kind of like the, the biggest contrast, despite... 
Uh, oh, <laughs> great. That's good. Uh, is that whereas Vietnam is a very chaotic yeah. and, and loud environment, Japan is a very um, organized and quiet environment. I see. You know, with the exception of if you go to areas that are known for bars on a Friday night or Saturday yeah. night, okay, it, it might be yeah rowdy or loud or whatever. But like a tourist um, touristy place. Yeah, especially if you were yeah. to go to like a touristy place, it's going to be a lot more lively. And Japanese people loosen up a lot after they've had a few drinks. Um, but in the morning, like from the time they're going to work until until the time that they're drinking, it's a pretty reserved, self-controlled. Like they don't they don't use their phone. They don't they don't talk on the phone on the train. Oh, you know it's. I I met a lot of Japanese, um, and I flew with Anna Airlines and a couple of times, and I would say, Japanese are. You know the most polite people on earth, and I, I would you say so? Uh, it's a way of in, that's one way to interpret it. Yeah, you know, um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Whether or not it's a behavior is polite, I think mm -hmm. is very much culturally specific. Um, you could look at. Okay, one common Vietnamese behavior, a lot of foreigners notice this when they come to Vietnam, is you'll meet somebody for the first time, and they'll be like, how old are you? Are you yes. married? Yeah, you know, what's it, your salary? Yeah, yeah. what's your salary? Questions that uh, Very are too personal. Too personal, yes. I hate that. But that's I think it's not coming from a bad place, you know? I think it's one of the Vietnamese ways of being polite. It's culturally different. Yeah. So, uh, Japanese are certainly concerned with public image and with not being offensive. Uh, but it it can potentially come at a... The flip side of that could be that you don't really know what the person's oh, opinion of you is. They won't oh. tell you necessarily to your face. I see. You know, so... It's, it's like a double-edged sword. I see. I understand. Um, but that's certainly the... When people come to Japan, their overall impression is, oh, everybody's so polite and everybody's so um, welcoming or, you know. Certainly service at like a restaurant mm -hmm. is way nicer in... in uh... Oh, man. I had... Should take like ten steps back before I say it like that, but <laughs> I, 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 in in my opinion, waiters in America at mm -hmm. the restaurants are. I mean, if, okay, it's you're gonna have a variety of experiences, but you can have some amazing experiences with waiters in America. Just okay. friendly banter, uh, like fun con conversation. Yeah, they'll it's just easier make to... you feel at home, make you feel welcome. Okay. Uh, give you some good suggestions about what to order. You know, okay. It, that's it's possible to have that kind of experience. It's also possible to have a really bad experience. Um in Japan, the experience will always be perfect. You you're not going to get a lot you in most cases you're not going to get a lot of interaction with the waiter, but but they will uh but you'll get the thing you asked for and it will come out, out on time and it'll be correct and uh, there's no tipping. So Yeah, you, that you was um, what I wanted to ask you about because um, as an American um, living in, in Japan, which is like a quite contrasting it's, um, about tipping. So what do you think um, about the tipping culture? Um, I don't like it mm -hmm. personally. Um, because when I was a kid, I seemed to remember it being 10% was the recommended. Yeah. And now it's up to 25% in some places. Yes. You know, so uh, 
I, fr- from my own perspective, what I, what I like is when I go to a restaurant, I want to know how much I have to pay. Okay. The price I see is ideally would include tax and service charge already like on the menu. So like, Oh, my drink's $10. Do I want to spend $10 on a drink? Okay. I will. Let's do this transaction rather than, Oh, it's $10. Okay. I can do that. And then we're going to add 8% tax to that. And we're going to add a 16% service charge to that. And I don't want to you know, do the math in my head, but it's yeah. going to be like $12 now. Right. Uh, and like, maybe I only had $10, Yeah, you know? So I, I, I just like it to be more straightforward. Like, this is what the price is. Do you want to pay that? Yes or no. And if the service is good, I'll come back. And if it's bad, I'll go to a different restaurant. I see. Um, but at the same time, you know, I definitely want the waiters to be paid a living wage. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, I just prefer that it's baked into the price and not this extra thing to do later. Um, do you, do you think that is getting a bit confusing in Vietnam at the moment? Because, you know, there are places um, where they actually expect tips and some places they don't. So basically, some you know, having been away for like two and a half years and Vietnam is, I mean, Saigon um, is developing, developing so fast at the moment and it's changing so quickly. Sometimes I, when I come to the restaurant, I don't know whether or not I should, you know, give them a tip. So do you think it's quite confusing in, in Vietnam at the moment? Or do you have any weird or bad experiences? Or When I first came, I uh, was told that tipping is not expected and I mm-hmm. did not tip. Okay. And I was happy with that. I was fine with that. Um, but I've got in the sense in the last couple of years that maybe you can tip. And so, um, I oftentimes will, and I don't calculate it out with like, okay, let me get my calculator and do yeah. 15% or something. I just, if I have a little bit of extra change left over, or I'll just throw down an extra 10 or sometimes an extra 20 thousand dong. So about a dollar yeah. extra, um, just to show that, just as kind of a way of saying thank you, mm-hmm. but I'm not doing it with the mindset that like you have to, that I have to, mm-hmm. or that it's necessarily going to be. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't actually. Whenever I tip, I have no confidence that the actual server is going to receive it. Okay. You know, you never really know. Is it, does it get shared by everybody in the restaurant? Is it just for the the one person that was serving you? Who, who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. But just from like the user experience of a consumer, I guess you know, I would say it makes me feel good to tip. Okay. Um, but I don't miss having that feeling in Japan where I just know what my what I'm in for at the beginning and I just pay it. Okay. Um, I definitely think the worst is America, where you kind of have to pay it, but you don't necessarily figure it into your calculations when you're placing your order. You know, um, and if you're if you're wealthy, it doesn't really matter. But if you're barely getting by and you're trying to watch your budget, yeah, it can make a big difference. Like that extra. Um, you know, let's say if what's sales sales tax plus tip could be like twenty five percent, so that extra twenty five percent is a lot. That makes a big difference in your in your budget. So I'd rather just know what I'm getting myself into from the beginning. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? What's your experience on that? Well, um, I because I was told about tipping culture in America, so when I came over, I already knew about about it. So I always tipped. Um, I actually felt kind of bad because sometimes um, I didn't have enough on me because um, it's all in my cart. And some places um, I went for tacos at you know next to the gym where I always went to. Um, 
and they um <clears throat> you know sometimes when you swipe a card on a new system you can you know they have uh buttons that you can choose like 10%, 15%, 20% or custom tip but um some places they don't have that you, they just swipe the card and then if you have the um if you have a change you can leave some tip and what if you don't like people would you're supposed to look at you you're supposed to write it onto the after the card's been swiped you write it onto the system and then later they basically oh, yeah, swipe your card again or something and they add it in there oh i, I see. think but oh. it's not clear it's not it, it's yeah. it's really confusing because i i don't really carry um cash around i just using my credit cards a lot um it's quite confusing sometimes for me and every time i we every time we went uh drinking you know me and my my friends were at the end of the night when we tried to figure out how much we we have to pay it's like everyone's like getting you know cell phone out to you know to use a calculator yeah it can be it can be awkward uh yeah and <laughs> My experience when I was, you know, in university, when I was a, a kid, let's say, mm -hmm. I mean, the first time I really experienced this was my, uh, my high school prom. We went out to dinner in a big group of people. Yeah. And then the bill came and everybody put down their money, what they felt that they owed. And invariably in those situations, you're short $20 or whatever. You're, yeah. you're, and it's like, okay, somebody or multiple people didn't fact factor in the tip into what they owed and that's like kind of where the difference is probably oh, yeah. and you know it just gets confusing in japan when you go to a restaurant with a group of people you'll just tell the, the waiter split it five ways and oh. then they just ring each person up individually oh that's so good. that part's taken care of as long as you're okay with splitting the bill equally oh yeah uh which i think is, i would be more comfortable with you know the japanese way of you know it's less confusing is um you know i mean i i don't like tipping either but still in america i heard about you know the page um i mean the minimum wage you know living on a very like people are people depending on tips a lot That, that's what I was told, actually. That's that's what they say, yeah. Um, I wa I watched a YouTube video explaining the tipping system at one point. And it was a good video, uh, so you should search it out if you care. But they essentially made the case that it's uh, kind of got racist origins. Okay. Um, like the. The, the very the tipping system kind of came from people getting jobs where they actually didn't get paid any salary oh and they were completely dependent on the tip but there's kind of a in in this video they kind of made the case that it's kind of a classist thing you're like well here you go here's something extra for you here's a tip for you okay you know and you're kind of making this dynamic where this person is superior, superior to, to the person giving the tip is superior to the person receiving it. Um, as opposed to, I just happen to be working as a waiter or as a bellhop or whatever, and this is my job. And, you know, we don't have to have a, it doesn't have to be about classism. Okay. I see. You know? Um, so I think in an ideal world, people should just get paid fairly. Exactly. Yeah. And you don't have to necessarily worry about tipping, but <laughs> I don't know. I mean, as a, it happens with 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 uh, another place I see this a lot is in dive operations, scuba diving operations. So, okay, you'll uh, scuba diving is generally not cheap, mm -hmm. so you're paying maybe sixty dollars, maybe a hundred dollars per dive to go out on this thing. But then there's still a tip jar for the boat staff or perhaps the dive staff. That's oh. like in addition to um, the the prices that you kind of looked at online in the beginning when you're planning your trip. So, uh, 
Yeah, I think just to kind of beat this horse to death, I think from a user experience standpoint, most customers, or at least price sensitive customers, they just want to know what the price is ahead of time so that they can plan and budget accordingly. Yeah, can prepare. And adding a tip or guilting you into a tip after the fact uh, is a kind of a bad ex user experience. Okay. But not as bad as working for suboptimal wages. You know, for that's the staff, true. if the staff really isn't getting paid enough and they're dependent on the tip, that's a bad user experience from yeah. the staff point of view. And um, it would be just be nice if everybody had a great experience. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know uh, where I, you know, if there's like an authoritative statement on this, like definitely we've done studies and without tips, it's without tipping, it's better or oh, cool. I don't know. So what are your thoughts on um, American healthcare system and, you know, education? you know, education system yeah. comparing to the rest of the world? Uh, I am in the Bernie Sanders camp on this one. Mm -hmm. I would like there to be uh, universal health care. Yeah, or, I'm with him too. You know, whether or not you have to pay into it, I'm not sure. But I think having a, a single-payer public option, whether it's free or you have to pay for it, uh, is Fantastic. Um, my son was born with the. My I I was a welfare baby myself when my parents first moved to America. They uh, didn't have a job, and my mom was pregnant. And no, uh, where where were they from? Or my mom's originally? American, but my dad's from South Africa. South Africa, okay. And they had a kind of a, a deal that if she ever got pregnant, they would move back to America because oh, they wanted she wanted me to be an American. Um, so eventually she got pregnant. They oh. moved back to America, and uh, they didn't have any money. And so I was like a discount baby. <laughs> like they didn't pay full rate. Like the, Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. The hospital took a pity on them and charged them just like a basic amount. And uh, kind of the same thing happened with my son. I happened to be between gigs at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in, in California, which in San Francisco, which happened to have a pretty good system for that. Oh, and, uh, I didn't know about that. Yeah, and the, the, the biggest risk, that the biggest argument against public health care is that I won't be able to see the doctor I want to see uh, the the service is going to be subpar because I'm not paying for a better service, and I have to tell you the our experience was amazing. Um, they had a midwife, so it was like more of a natural birth, and oh, you know, I guess you don't get to hang out you don't get to hang out very long in a hospital afterwards, you know, <laughs> get out of here. But uh, um, but I don't have anything negative to say about that. And especially, I just think that having healthcare tied to employment is a horrible idea. Okay. Uh, my background is the video game industry, mm -hmm. and it's very common for people in the game industry to work on a project by project basis, but okay. we're not unionized. So in uh, Broadway or in film, you also work project by project. Yeah. But you're in a union, and your health insurance is actually provided through the union. Oh, I see. So when that movie finishes or that Broadway show finishes and you're kind of auditioning or waiting for the next project to start, you don't lose your health care. Oh. Uh, with with the game industry, you have to buy into Cobra to keep your... Oh, I see. Um, I don't know if that's a California thing or a national thing, but you, you know, between gigs, you have to be paying for Cobra, which is uh, stupidly expensive, right? And... If you're healthy, it's not such a big deal. But uh, if you have any kind of pre-existing condition, you're screwed if you lose your job that you're getting your health care through. Um, so I think in terms of encourage, and you know, I think there's a lot of people who would choose to be an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, except they're just too afraid of what's going to happen if they lose their health care or they have a pre-existing condition and they're not able to get coverage. 
So yeah, come on, man. Why are we different than everybody else? Like Europe can do it fine. Japan can do it fine. Canada can do it fine. Like why? Uh, Europe are doing it.、Hmm? Like Europe too, I think. Universal healthcare. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Everyone. Everybody can do it except for the most, the most productive economy in the world can't、yeah. do it. Right. So that's Bernie Sanders'、uh, argument: is essentially why is the most, the largest economy in the world, the only d- industrialized economy that's not providing universal health care to its citizens? Like, why can't we afford to do it, but everyone else can afford to do it? Yeah, I find the. I find the、um, insurances, you know, system the way that that insurances,、um, all the insurance companies in America work is confusing too for some reason. Is、um, if you're shopping for a healthcare plan now, I ha- admittedly I haven't done this in many years, but、uh-huh. if you're shopping for a healthcare plan, you're looking at your options and you're like, I don't really like any of these options. Okay, like the only ones I can afford are catastrophic. Oh yes. So, my bill would have to be like more than thirty thousand dollars before it kicks in or something. Yeah. You know, so it's it's just for totally worst case scenario. Like,、um, I get cancer. I'm involved in an automobile accident and I'm hospitalized for six months or something like. Worst case scenario, but I want to be healthy. Why can't I go to?、Uh, Why am I? Why can't I go to the doctor for biannual checkups or? Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, the one thing I find is, you know, you know, going to the doctor in America is crazily expensive, and、um, like for example, you can, I, 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 you know, before I came back to Vietnam, I used to work at an eye clinic, and you know, for, for, for. Comprehensive eye exam.、Um, one has to pay a hundred twenty dollars. Whereas in Vietnam, is is less than you know, I would say. Let's say five hundred thousand dong, which is twenty twenty something dollars, three dollars. Yeah, and you get a full eye exam. And you know, if you buy glasses from you know. Spectacles from a lot of、um, shop around Saigon. Sometimes they offer a free eye exam. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So if you want to go to、uh, Lens Crafters in America, yeah, and get a pair of glasses,、um, if you add the exam, the cost of the lenses and the cost of the frames all together, it's not hard for that to be four hundred dollars. Exactly. Yes. And、uh, I just got a new pair of specs he- here in Vietnam, and my total cost was fifty dollars for the、yeah. exam and the and the frame and the glasses. So it's an eight x difference in price. Yes, like I mean,、um, in order to get like a really good, let's say just the lenses themselves, if you get if you buy a, a really good pair of lenses in. America, it could go up to like at the clinic where I used to work.、Um, it could go easily go up to three or four hundred dollars for just the lenses, plus the frame. You know, it depends on you know what kind of frames, designers' frames, or just a normal regular frame. So it, a lot of people, you know, it easily go up to five six hundred. Dollars or maybe like a thousand dollars, if you choose like a really good,、um, you put on a, you know a lot of options like you know anti reflective,、um, anti scratching,、um, blue lights the new blue lights the new、that. thing yes, <laughs>、um, Polaroid and everything it goes up to seven hundred dollars, and you know, and the frame, and it's crazy. Um, here, for a really good pair of frames, like four options, I could easily pay a、um, hundred dollars, or even a little bit more. Like let's say a hundred twenty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. 
I can understand like the eye exam part being expensive in the states because uh, perhaps you know the eye doctor that's giving you the exam they're expecting a certain salary. Oh uh, yes, for their time and the cost of living is different. But uh, the other parts, like the price of the lenses being such different, is kind of surprising. Yeah, <laughs> that, like, that's like quite shocking that because uh, I, you know, I I can switch back and forth between my $50 pair and my $400 pair, and there's yeah. no difference exactly. as far as I can tell. <laughs> I mean, um, I got a good pair in Vietnam, and the lenses are Hoya, which is from Japan, made, made by Hoya. So I think, and I pay um, two millions, uh, two millions Vietnam dong, which is like nearly like $100. And it's Japanese. And in America, you get like a an in-house pair of lenses, which is not as good as the Hoya ones. Is three hundred, four hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, so you asked me what was my opinion on universal health care, but uh, what's your opinion on it? I love it. Okay. Yeah, I'm all for it. Would you consider yourself? Uh, on the right or the left or the center? I would say, oh, that's, um, a, that's a very interesting question because I would say my, I, see myself, I see myself as in the center but leaning to the left, a little bit to the left. Not the, not the far left. They are, for me, they are too far gone. You mean like the Antifa People yeah. Or, so, yes. Like how far? Like universal health care, uh, within America's political landscape, is considered to be far left. However, in terms of actual polling, is pretty center. Like a lot of people are in favor of it. I think. Um, I mean, I didn't know that. I didn't know about you know when you said um, they are the far left, but uh, I would say, you know. Politically, it's communist, you know. politically, <laughs> and uh, I would say religiously, I would be in the middle, and but leaning a little bit to the left. Um, um, the th I think one of the thing I hate about the world at the moment is the political correctness. Uh -huh. um, you know, people can't say anything anymore, and it's too far gone is what they say, say, you know, PC gone mad. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very interesting uh, topic. It comes up on the Ro the Joe Rogan Experience podcast yeah. a lot. Th that topic comes up a lot. Came up with me this week. Um, I watched the latest Chappelle special, David Chappelle yeah, Dave special Chappelle. on um, Netflix. And then a couple days later... Um, Tim Pool, I don't know if you're familiar with him. No, I know Dave, he's a lefty but... guy who is against this extreme left anti PC stuff. So it's kind of probably in, in probably similar politically to you. But he made a twi tweet about it, uh, saying how it has a zero percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. So I went and checked it out, and there was no user review scores at the time, and there was five uh, professional. Critics. Critic reviews, they're all negative. Uh, I left a review. I saw it. I thought it was amazing. I gave it five stars. I come back two days later, refresh the page, look at it again. Critical reviews are up to 33% now. There's eight reviews, so like still most of them are negative. And it has a 99% user score with 14,000 reviews. Yes, I saw someone <laughs> posted it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I saw, I saw, I saw that actually. Um, so, I am more familiar, you know, familiar with um, the British humor. Um, you know, I self-deprecating. Yeah, um, really dark, really dry, sarcastic sense of humor. But um, America, I do like, um, like Keen Peel. Mm. I love them. Yeah, Dave Chappelle. Of course, I love. Um, there's a new. They're not really new. They 
They've been around, I would say, about ten years. It's College Humor. Oh right, and the website. I, I love them. They are. I love swearing, to be honest. And、uh, you know, they, 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 they did a sketch about,、uh, you know, political correctness gone mad, and I thought it was brilliant. This is a, this is a, such an interesting topic because、um, I would consider myself very far left. Mm-hmm. But, um, but from my point of view, free speech is a left value, or it's it shouldn't even be left or right. It's just like a very American. It's a standard, value, right? Yeah. It's uh. It's land of the free. Yeah. Freedom is one of the most important things, and being able to、uh, speak your mind, whether you're right or wrong, is 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 part of that. Um, and it's just very shocking to see. The far left. I don't even know if it's worth calling them that because they don't.、Uh, they see they they、It's、have changing. The, they, yeah, that's why I called it earlier, like the、um, anti-fascist fascist club. Yeah, you know, in in、uh, kind of reference to that anti-social social club fashion brand. Yeah, I, I kind of want to make a parody one that says anti-fascist fascist club because that's an irony to it. Yeah, yeah there's just it?、Um, that behavior of shutting other people down is. Is a、uh, fascist behavior, basically. Exactly.、Know? Yes. So, yeah, just.、Um, I mean, I'm in favor of having a good time. You know? Yeah.、Uh, as long as nobody gets hurt, right? Yes. You know.、Um, so, if somebody was going onto a university campus and inciting violence against a minority group,、um, that's definitely gone too far, and that、mm-hmm. should be shut down. But if you're just expressing unsavory opinions. But the funny thing about most of the comedy that we're enjoying, that's also going too far for the extra far left. It's it's not right wing stuff at all. It's not. No, it's no. not. It's it's still very liberal and very free thinking ideas, and it's just kind of、uh, irony might be the word, but it seems too unfortunate for irony. <laughs> I don't know. I, I mean, you know that that it that this kind of humor would be so criticized by、uh, people, presumably on the left. You see a lot of it in.、Um, there's certain like、uh, publications these days that when they when somebody links them on the internet or they're being suggested you know, with some kind of clickbaity title, I'm like. Uh, I don't, I don't.、Oh, Vice is the one that sticks out in my mind the most. Place like, I absolutely, if if it was covered by Vice, I just assume it's about 180 degrees incorrect or something.、Oh, you know, <laughs> which is、uh, too bad. It, I I wish that if if they came out with an article, I'd be like, oh, let me let this could be interesting. It could be investigative. There could be some thing important being un- uncovered here, but that's. Doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to be very、uh, one-sided, very、uh, agenda-driven. So, I think on a related、um, on a related topic about you know being you know left or right, I think、um, I'm not sure if you have experienced this in Vietnam because you know for the past two and a half years you were. Here, you just moved to Japan when? Only like in November, so eight months or something. Eight months. But before、yeah. that, maybe almost eight years here. So yeah. So have you ever experienced this?、Um, like, I would see myself as supporter of the, you know, LGBT community, you know. But I,、um, you know, having lived in Portland, I experienced、um, this particular thing. That、um, where you subconsciously, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm using the word correctly. Assume a person's gender, and they actually get upset,、mm. and they get really mad about it. And I been in that kind of situation for about four or five times. So I. Um, it was hard for me to actually 
open up to meet new people without offending them in some way because um I don't know if I might offend someone. Yeah. That even happened uh Have you have you ever experienced this here? Yeah. Uh really? well it's it's weird. Uh the last time I went back to San Francisco, oh, okay. I met with friends and I I could feel it. I could feel this certain assumptions that they were having. I could I could I could feel that they were not listening to Joe Rogan's podcast, for instance. I mean I could uh that there's a there's this weird narrative that has taken over the psyche of the Pacific Northwest, including as far down as San Francisco. Okay. So probably Seattle, definitely Portland, definitely yeah, San Francisco. Seattle is like three hours away. Yeah. That there's a certain um I would say there's assumptions being made. Yeah. Like like people assume that a certain person's position is right wing when actually it's centrist or left wing. Uh oh man. I I got unfriended on Facebook by a former boss. Mm. Um who lived who had been living in the Bay Area for a long time and now they're in Seattle working for Microsoft. And uh they just went on this. They would constantly go on these tirades against PewDiePie. Uh, against what? Sorry? PewDiePie. Do you know who he is? He uh, he's a YouTuber. He has oh a, Pew, Pew. PewDiePie. PewDiePie. Oh yeah, yeah, I know him. He has is a hundred Swedish. Yeah, he's or... Swedish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him. Uh, he's made a few oopsies. Yeah. In the past, but I've seen. You know, I was like, okay, let me investigate this guy that people are talking shit about. So I started watching his videos. I'm okay. like, this guy is a nice guy. You know, he's made a few oopsies, but I don't think he's ever been mean hearted. You know, I don't think I don't think he's a racist and I don't think he's a bigot. But he gets uh painted as a racist. Yeah. All the time. I don't think he is. I mean, I having been like so there's people who say this guy said this let's cancel him. He's a racist, whatever. And then they're not, they just take that information at the face value. They don't perhaps do what I did, which is, okay, let me look at some of this guy's videos and see how he does behave over many years. Mm -hmm. Not just like in one five minute segment one day. And, uh, so I asked this guy, I said, this former boss, I was like, what do you have against PewDiePie? Like you're always, really vocal against him. And uh, he's like, well, he's a Nazi and a racist. And I'm like, well, here's something he said. Like, or let's define racist or let's define Nazism. And that was it. I was, I was trying to have like a nuanced discussion about it and uh, just was immediately uh, unfriended. No. Oh. So, you know, it actually really affected me that he unfriended me. It, it kind of put me in a funk for a couple of days and I just kept playing it over and over in my head uh, until I was like, ah, screw that guy. You know, we had an important uh, business meeting once and he showed up in a Cheerios t-shirt. Cheerio? Yeah. Which, you know, I don't know. Maybe don't wear a Cheerios t-shirt to an important business meeting. It's a business mis meeting. I think. Yes. But... Maybe I'm too right wing. <laughs> no, no. But uh, I'm not sure if it's related to what we've been talking. But um, I find it funny when, um, like, certain groups of people, especially, um, you know, about the plus size model. Yeah. The plus size people. Sure. And um, I find it. Um, hilarious and ridiculous when they actually protest at Victoria Secret's um, store and they demand to have, you know, you know, Victoria Secret to have, you know, clothing of their sizes. Um, ironically, um, I found out that Victoria Secret, you know, they do have plus size uh, clothing but then 
again, these women demand also, you know, also demand that Victoria's Secret to have plus size model on the runway, I think, on the, you know, the angel so shows. And in my opinion, it's like, there's nothing wrong with plus size model, nothing wrong with plus size um, uh, people. The thing is, like, each company has their own target. I would, I would not, I would never go to an Apple store and ask for a gaming laptop. Because, you know, Apple is not known for, you know, building, like, gaming stuff. And, you, you know, there is a plus, uh, um, like, a the brand store. The brands are specialized plus for sizes. plus size people, like Torrid. And you wouldn't see, you know, uh, smaller size women protesting at Torrid. And why, I mean, what did you think about it? Yeah, it... If Victoria's Secret were to, in response to protests, mm -hmm. include a plus size model or all plus size models in their runway show, it, it feels like a mistake on all sides to me because it's only being done as a reaction. It's not sincere, right? If, without any prompting, they had a creative director that says, this year we're going to fuck things up a little bit. Okay. This year, we're going to have only plus size models. Not because we're getting any pressure, just because we have a statement we want to make. Now that, that sounds more interesting, that sounds more powerful. Yes. Um, I once tried to buy a shirt at a little boutique in Japan. Uh -huh. I tried on a large. It didn't even fit over my arms. My forearms were too big to go into the sleeves. And the staff... The, the, the staff there said to me, um, I'm sorry, we only make clothes for skinny people. <laughs> you know? You're not even... <laughs> right. And I'm not plus-sized. Um, if, if, if I have to make like a policy, if I'm designing the laws, it's fine for every brand to have their own way to market and their own way to, um, to target customers. Yeah. To, you know, I would say so. Yeah. Um, you know, because I'm I'm a sh very short guy, and um, every time I I I need a pair of trousers from the store, I always have to I have I have to take them to a tailor and have it cut off. Yeah. So I, I mean, do you feel you're being marginalized no, by I, all the I, tall I, runway models? I wish I were taller. I don't. I I I would never say, oh, you should make you know stuff for smaller people. I would never say that. Um, I would say... I You'd mean, have to look at it like an opportunity if you were inclined... If if you were a plus-size woman with... Um, or a short man... Yeah. With... Who was constantly being disappointed by not being able to find something that fit you in the stores, you would be motivated, I believe, uh, to start your own line specializing yeah, exactly. in clothing for short people or clothing for plus size women or or whatever you yeah, know you have and you would see a need in the market and you would you would go after it and maybe your runway shows would be more popular than victoria's secrets or maybe you'd have better financials after some years of business right or maybe you wouldn't but uh you know it, well, this is like also like a question of free speech. Should these uh, women who are unhappy about plus there being a lack of plus size models in high fashion, should they be allowed to express their opinion on? Yes, this? they they do definitely. Yes. But um, what they but were like, doing is like they actually, you know, protesting inside a Victoria's Secret shop is obstructing people's business. I would say. Because they went around inside the store and outside of the store, and they blocking people from... Yeah, it, it would be um, like a, 
they they have the right to speak. The people who yes. are against animal cruelty. Yes. I forget the name, the acronym for their organization. P uh, PETA. PETA. People. Yes. Against the treatment of animals or something, something like. That. Something, or people for the ethical treatment of animals, so, 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 probably something like that. Uh, they've done, um, I, th I think they did some campaigns where they, like, on a sidewalk, had two people laying around naked. Oh yeah, I've and that's I've seen cool. that. That's, that's cool. totally cool. Yep. And they've had campaigns where they uh, throw red paint on people's fur coats, and that's probably counterproductive. Well, know. you it's hard to tell when... I mean, you're destroying somebody else's property. Which so, is, firstly, it's you know. property. So, secondly, you don't know for sure if it's fake or real fur. Now, yeah. you know, people... I know a lot of people who are wearing really good quality fake fur. So, it's really hard to tell, you know, just by looking. It, oh, it's... Rufa, no, it's not. So, I mean, Peter, yes, I, I mean, I'm not a vegan, but I am also against, you know, the, you know, animal cruelty. But Peter also has done some campaigns where they protesting inside steak restaurants, and you know, I, I don't want to, you know, let's say I'm going on a date with my girlfriend or whatever. I don't want to hear, to see people walking around at restaurants yelling and, you know, opening, like showing, projecting the videos of, you know, a cow being murdered. It just ruin, ruining other people's, you know, good time. Yeah, so I don't think we have a lot of um, guidelines or Uh, architecture for what's appropriate and what's inappropriate ways of protesting. And it might be hard to even come up with them because the goalposts could always be moving. Uh, lots of protests shut down city streets. Is that going too far? You know, like, or is that not far enough? Um, you know, I think in the case of the civil rights movement and like a million man march or whatever, if some streets had to be shut down for that to happen, it was the ends justified the means or, you know, I, it was poignant enough that it was important. Um, but is, I don't know, is... I guess the the, pro the problem with like projecting things just outside or just inside a steak restaurant is you are you are dealing with private property and private enterprise and people's lives. the 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 protesters certainly feel justified. They feel that this is so important. Yeah. That even if you have a bad evening because of it, you need to know, you need to understand that your actions, like you're eating a steak, but it's not just eating a steak. You've got, like, this is the industry that's supporting your night out tonight. You know? yeah. And this is how you are involved with that. And I think that's actually an important message to communicate, but the question's always going to be, what's the most effective way to communicate that? What's the most thought-provoking way to communicate that? And can you be very thought-provoking and effective without being a menace to society? <laughs> yeah. Because it would be nice if you could... It would be nice if you can be heard and make your point and educate people in a way that doesn't make you a menace to society. I, And I'm not sure... I don't know if there's really... I don't know if we can... It might always be a gray area and we always have to keep re-examining it. Yeah, that's, I... There's another thing about pizza is they, in my opinions, sometimes they've gone too far. Like, um, I think, I'm not sure if it was uh, earlier this year or last year, um, where 
you know, it was the um, the death anniversary of the, you know the late Steve Irwin. You know, uh, the Australians. Oh, the crocodile hunter. Yes. Um, he wasn't. He wasn't even the hunter. He's kind wasn't of. That, wasn't that his name? though? wasn't that his moniker. He wasn't actually a person who hunted crocodiles. No, he wasn't. He wasn't a hunter. Hunt, he wasn't a crocodile poacher he, or something. He was a just a wildlife entertainer who would. He studied them. Yeah, he studied them, and on his death anniversaries, um, you know, Peter just tweeted a really nasty tweet like tweet about Steve Irwin and I think it's a little bit too far because you know to my generation I'm not sure I I don't know about the other but Steve Irwin he made us love animals more than ever watching his shows we learn about wildlife we learn about crocodiles we learn about you know we he made us love animal more than ever. And, you know, they made, um, they made a joke about, um, you know, him being stung by, you know. Stingray, yeah. Uh, the stingray. And the cause of his death. On his death anniversary. Which is, I, I, th- I think it was a little bit too far. Because, uh, I mean, to be honest, um, I'm all for gallows dark humor but that wasn't i think that was in call for i think it's yeah it's because this, he was i just uh, i just wonder we have to wonder where is the we i i may agree with you but we have to wonder where is the line because mm-hmm. uh it is in a way a mirror of the critique of the latest Chappelle special uh-huh. for instance like, oh, I think that was a line you shouldn't have crossed. That was in poor taste. Yeah. And I'm like, but it was fucking funny. Yeah. <laughs> right? And it was poignant. Now, I, I don't you know, know the exact joke, tweet that Peter made. Maybe it was funny. Prob- definitely it was in poor taste, but what? It wasn't you know? funny. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it was not from my point of view, but... Even from, what was the point uh, they were trying to make? They're just like saying, "Ha ha, he died." Yeah, like exactly. I don't really understand. Did they see him as uh, someone who was? Um, he was and, a meat eater. Oh well, yeah. he's Australian. I think that they all are. <laughs> well, I mean that's true. I mean, <laughs> but but yeah, you were right. It's more like "Ha ha, he died." That's kind of weird. Uh, he got stung by a stingray. Yeah. It's like you ate you you caused harm to animals and an animal killed you, so it's just desserts. Maybe that's the point they're trying to make, but I, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's it, this is kind of similar to zoos, which uh, you there's a lot of arguments you could make for zoos being you know, bad environments for animals to live in. Yeah, they are certainly captive. certainly the Saigon Zoo is not yeah, it's, necessarily a great example of environment for animals. It's a very depressing place. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know um, the lions. Uh, the lions there are so fucking sad. They 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 look they look depressed. So, but zoos do an amazing. They play in a, a very important role in conservation. Yeah, you know they bring in money. They they spend a lot of money on conservation efforts in the wild. They take part in rehabilitation programs, also where they bring in sick animals, rehabilitate them, and try to release them into the wild. They do breeding programs where they try to increase the numbers of of a uh, animal population and again reintroduce them into wild. And uh, the better zoos, like I'm, my hometown is Columbus, Ohio, and it's got. You know, sometimes within the top, it's I think it's within the top three zoos in America. Oh, sometimes it might be number two, maybe even sometimes it's number one. But, uh, and I think every year they're renovating their stuff, trying to make it better, trying to make the artificial environment that the animals are living in 
close that to the wildlife. Yeah, as yeah. as enjoyable for the animals living in it as possible. Yes. They're not trying to create a hardship environment. I think a, a zoo in a third world, well, <laughs> zoos in developing nations uh, probably are also not trying. They're not like, how can I make the life of this animal miserable? They might not have the resources to have a better enclosure. They might not have the expertise to, um, you know, create the optimal diet for the animals. I don't know. But regardless of even a bad zoo still has a certain number of people going through it and seeing animals that they may have not seen otherwise. And there's an opportunity there for the audience to become curious about yeah. animals and about conservation and maybe make a difference in the world, right? Uh, that's beneficial for animals. Um, yeah, I know it's probably a case by case basis, but I mean, there might be some zoos that it's really, they're just making a profit. They're just like selling tickets to a amusement. Yeah. And, um, trying to make money and not not playing a part in conservation and not doing a part in education. If that's so, it's uh, that's too bad, and it would be nice if they get more involved in the real conservational approaches. But oh, yeah. I see what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Like, I, to be honest, I am all against animal circuses. Oh. Uh. Yes. I would never pay a penny to, to go see animal being whipped or forced to learn some tricks to entertain people. And then, you know, they live in cages. And that's what I hate. But, um, like, I I think I, I saw it so many times on YouTube where, you know, vegan protesters blocking the meat aisles in a supermarket, you know, pre pre you know, preventing people from buying meat. I, th I also think that's too far because, you know, it's interfering with other people's lives. I the think thing is it's, those animals are already dead. Yes. At that point. And if you, I don't know, for them to just die and, and have their meat rot seems like a so it's such a shame for the animal as well like now now they really died for nothing yeah you know it's i would i think the it's better if you try to tackle the problem at in the a different point. way yes. yeah i mean the the problem with the problem with the meat at the supermarket is not the fact that there's meat at the supermarket. It's probably the real problem is that that animal had a really bad life from the time they were born until the time they were killed. They were probably raised in horrific factory farming conditions. And, you know, trying to legislate that industry so that everything is open free range or something. Yeah. But even then you have problems. If it makes things free range, you're cutting down the rainforest. So, you know, it's really hard to, uh, it's hard to live ethically in yeah. such a complex interconnected world. You say, Oh, we need things to be free range, but to make more range, we have to cut down more trees and we need space. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, vertical farming is interesting. You know, urban farming, making gardens in your city, oh, yeah. and being able just to eat produce that's um, being grown that doesn't have to be transported by fossil fuels over large distances. You know, there's probably, I think if you have access to um, high quality fresh fruit, you'll probably eat less meat Yeah. in general. You know, I mean, if I, your meat's old and from far away, and your fruit's just right there, and you can pick it off a tree and eat it your, immediately, um, you'll probably end up eating less meat. I'm trying to um, eat less meat as possible. Um, I'm re I'm replacing, um, not really 
not entirely, but I'm re- um, I eat a lot of mushrooms, mm-hmm. and it's a great sh- source of proteins. And I think I, when I, my time living alone in the states, I would say eight out of ten meals, I I had mushrooms in it, and it's it was a great source of protein in this, you know. Um, but at the same time, I really miss. If I had to go vegan for like two days, I would fucking miss the meat. Have you had any of the Beyond Meat Impossible Burger type stuff? Oh, the um, the lab grown. No, it's um, it's not lab grown meat. I think it's uh, vegetables, but they reproduce certain chemicals. Uh, from plants that are what make mm. meat taste like meat. No, I haven't. Like kind of, it's kind of like that iron, the iron taste that blood has. Oh, you know, they've there's certain. Um, anyways, there's certain chemicals that that's like why meat tastes like meat, and actually some plants do produce that chemical, so they're doing that. And these vegetable burgers are you know taste I like they're tried eating. That. I would People look. say it's pretty close, pretty close oh. to uh, the real thing. Yeah. Well, oh. I uh, I was in the states recently. I saw a few places serving it, but um, I didn't actually get a chance to try it out. So. Yeah, it's like most. Uh, I I would say many places in Portland offer like vegan meals. Um, but no, I haven't tried it. I know a few people here uh, are making cheese out of cashew nuts, and I would love to try that. Uh, well, get back to me. Let me know if you think it's as good as real cheese. Yeah, there's a vegan a vegan bakery in my in the same building that my co working uh, bakery. Yeah, there's a vegan bakery in the same building as my office. In Japan, and uh, they asked me to. They they generally make pretty nice stuff, but they asked me to try one of their pastries. And they okay. asked for feedback, and I said, "It's a little dry. I think it needs more butter." <laughs> they, <laughs> a little bit of eggs. Yeah, it needs more butter. Maybe some egg. Make it a little maybe bit better. Ham, maybe bacon. They did a revision. They they ended up make making. They the next week when I walked by, they're hey come here try this, and they had put a lot more vegetable oil in it. Oh okay. And um, it was better. It was it was better, but probably smallest. still not as good as butter. No, it's not. I th- well, let's get perhaps let's get back to like creative field. Yeah. Okay. So do what do you find um about the um creative industry in Saigon comparing it to um Japan because you've oh. been living in two places I would say it's not really uh I don't f- feel I can speak authoritatively on this subject at this time okay um I I because in Japan, I don't have a lot of friends yet. Okay. Um, and most of the people I know are doing freelance. Oh, okay. Most of my friends that I do have are, are doing freelance. But most of Japan are salary men, salary women. Oh, okay. You know. um, and besides, you are living not in not a really big city? Yeah, I guess that's that could have something to do with it. Um, generally... I think mainstream Japanese graphic design, for instance, I'm not really a fan of. In 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 Western graphic design, early on you're taught by watching, by just seeing people make fun of things. You're okay. taught you should not outline things if possible. You shouldn't put drop shadows on things if possible. These are like last resort techniques okay. to make your text legible like 
I, ideally, you don't want outlines. Ideally, you don't want bevels. Ideally, you don't want drop shadows. It makes it look cheaper or whatever. Oh, okay. All these effects that were like Photoshop could do and made really easy to do and like lens flares also, right? And then they became kind of poo-pooed on, especially with things moving towards like flat design and stuff. Okay. But in Japan, it's very common for text to have like two, even two outlines around. Two outlines? Yeah, and a glow and a drop shadow and everything. Oh. Um, I noticed the outlines. Yeah. But I, I, I think it's done for legibil legibility because the kanji, the Chinese characters have so m many details in them that you're trying to make those, the actual form of the letter pop out against the background. Oh, I so see. maybe it's on a photograph. And if it was just the text without any kind of outline, you might lose that. Oh. You might, that might not be details. as clear from a detail from a distance. You're like, okay. I definitely want the audience to be able to read this word. So let's make that word very yeah. over the top in terms of how it's separated from the background with all these effects. Uh, and you'll see that on print and you'll see it on television as well. Um, what I love about Japan is the, um, the simplicity in their designs. Um, Interior designs, um, they're like everything. It that's, looks that's the that's like this interesting dichotomy because when it comes to um, physical things, mm -hmm. whether it's a a piece of cloth or a cup or whatever, yes, very minimal, very natural. And wabi sabi, like worn textures and stuff. Okay. But then you have like the any any time they re, like they they show text on a on a graphic design, it's always over the top. Yeah. Not so. not always, I guess. I mean, I see. But there's a trend that you always see. What I would call garish typography. I see. Versus everything else which is so minimal and zen as it were oh i see you know so poignant just to the point i think you'll find that with animation too japanese anime whereas you have these masterpieces that are normally made for the theater stuff like a miyazaki film mm -hmm. which are very much like in the vein of japanese craftsmanship oh and then you'll have much lower budget TV animations that are like targeted at targeted at otaku, targeted oh. at you know something like a, a, a the, the characters are in a boy band or the characters are in a girl band. And, oh, I see. And it's as garish as the typography. Oh, that typographic stuff. It, there's nothing subtle about it. It's all over the top. And it's not for me, obviously. I'm generally more into minimalism than minimalism, yes. You know, than uh, garishness. But when I first moved to Vietnam, I think the only word you could use to describe chaos was it Vietnamese design would be garish, garish, or or similar words. Uh, um, Kitsch, garish, um, cheesy, these kind of cheesy. I would yeah, say the, the these word kind of words. Cheesy. But it's gotten way different in the last eight years. Yes, design has become much more sophisticated in that yes. time. So, you know, that's a good sign because um, I think the young, the young generations of um, designers, um, they have got the opportunities to study. From you know, from YouTube, from Facebook, from you know, different sources around the world, be that you know Scandinavians or Japanese designs, they are always you know simple and minimalistic. And I think there's a trend in Vietnam, um, in I would say in interior designs mostly. 
is um, quite Koreans and Japanese. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I know what you you mean. Like uh, a lot of use of wood, a lot of use of concrete, yeah, stone. Introducing neutral some colors. plants into the environment, and very neutral colors. Yeah, it's... we were just talking about architecture. Jeez, man, Vietnam has a lot going on with architecture. Yeah, yeah, you have. Um, indigenous Vietnamese architectural styles. You have the French influence. Yes. And now you've got all these more Scandinavian and, and industrial. Korean and industrial influences. So yes. there is a lot going on. And um, you can see, I mean, shit, we're in a kind of a villa right now. And across the street from here, there's this weird tree that starts in the indoors of the building and then goes out through a window into That's the outside. Did normal. you see that? Yes. So, um, it's interesting. Which one would you, would be your favorite? I think it really depends on, uh, context. So I wouldn't really want to live in a colonial style house because I like to use air conditioning, and they're probably not yeah. really designed with that in mind. Um, I'm per personally kind of drawn towards more of an industrial, industrial look for either my living space or my working space. Me you know, too. I would yes. kind of prefer that. Big windows, high ceilings, exposed beams. You know, I like that kind of... It's like a combination between metal and wood. Yes. Yeah. It's maybe, beautiful. Maybe ex some exposed brick. Ho yes. Hopefully real brick and not just a facade, because you see that a lot. Everybody's yes. putting fake brick facades yeah, on just, the interiors. Um, wallpapers with a yeah. like, little tiny... You know. Yeah. yeah. They I might know even you be mean. like real bricks, but they're just glued on. Yeah. You know? And I don't like that, actually. I like things to be... I like things to be made out of what they look they're made out of what it looks like they're made out of. Exactly. You know, I don't like fake wood floors. I want it to be hardwood if possible. Um, though in, in, in Vietnam with it being as, as humid as it is, that can be a problem because yeah. the wood expands and contracts and stuff. Um, and if it looks like stone, can it just be stone? I, you know, if it's going to be concrete, let it look like concrete. Don't try to make it look like stone. For, for for me, you know, I just want things to look like what they are. I understand. You know? Yeah, I'm with you. More honest, <laughs> honest architecture. I'm not really a fan of facades in general. You see it a lot. Like people take whatever building and they'll put like an aluminum facade, and now it looks like it's modern, but it's just a it's still it's the not. shitty building it was before. It's not like the Apple Store or something that was built from the ground up to yeah. be modern so well reggie thank you for spending time with us today it's thank you great to see you uh back here in vietnam after all this time uh how long were you in america for uh i was there for two and a half years well it's, it's good to have you back thank you if people want to check out your instagram to see some of your of your photography where could they go my instagram is reggie j photos it's uh, um one word so R E G G I E J photos. Yes, correct. All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. And we'll see you all later. 